Okay, so I will keep track of attendees who have to report out. Okay, I'm giving people just a minute to get in. Yeah, sure. Okay, welcome everyone to the um, April 8th uh, District Planning Committee meeting. Just wanted to take a minute to review the purpose and the goals to remind us um, why we're here. The purpose of the District Planning Committee will be to develop and recommend to the Cape Elizabeth School Board a plan or plans to return our students to in-school learning while honoring the following three goals safety of students and staff, students learning assessment and equity, social and emotional well-being of students and staff. So we're into the report out section um, of our meeting and uh, we, we hopefully will have time to hear from each breakout group um, from, from your reporter. So um, I um, Give us two or three of the important points that came up in your meeting and we'll try not to repeat uh, what we've heard before. So if, um, if another reporter mentions something that you were going to say, pick another point that came out of your discussion. Um, we'll stop report outs around 3.50. So if we don't get to your group, um, you can just email me your comments and I'll add them to our, um, to our notes. So, um, Let's start with group one. Thank you. Uh, so I actually don't have access yet to the notes that one of the um, members of the public was, uh, or someone was taking for the group, but I jotted down some notes and my, my the takeaway that I have, and I, I invite Aaron to correct me or, or fill in the gaps. Um, there is a mix of parents of mostly elementary, but also some middle and high school parents of hy uh, hybrid students and a few remote uh, students. And the general theme of the comments from the hybrid parents were the, um, the, that the, what was deficient and what was lagging in the hybrid schedule was, was uh, you know, the pacing, the response time with teachers, the social interactions, um, uh, the social learning component it was so lacking on hybrid days or remote days that they there was a great concern about having to continue with that and how much worse it might get by the end of the year um, and how much more we'd have to do to correct it at the if we wait until the fall. The with that, uh, there was an acknowledgement of the risks, you know, the disruption of schedules and um, things like that and having to relearn. Um, uh, you know, community classroom community expectations, but they all seem to consider that totally worth it and didn't understand um, why we would put off trying to correct um, these perceived um, problems with with the way things are um, are are having occurring now in hybrid. Uh, the greatest concern that I noted by the parents of remote teacher uh, students was that, um, unfortunately, nothing would change for them. There would be no, um, they concerned about not having increased opportunities for their students um, to interact in person with their classmates. Um, I hope Great. I summed it up well. That, that, that was your three, so good. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, two. So, uh, I have a report out for group two. I mean, I'm just, there were many things mentioned regarding all the different questions, some things that jump out, um, the, just a general consensus that the longer we're out, the more difficult it is to return at some normalcy in the, in the fall. I mean, that's obvious, but I think it's really, really, really to be stated. Um, the idea of needing to build kids uh, academic endurance and the idea of just sort of getting them back in school four days a week and getting them prepared for the fall as well was mentioned. Um, that was, that was the big takeaway. I think that the idea that uh, that there's tremendous amount of social isolation across the spectrum with different types of kids, those that are both like uh, single children in homes, as well as you know other issues where kids are just needing to interact with peers much more than they're already doing, um, and that that problem exists K to 12. It, it's not related to any specific age group. Thanks, Nate. 
group three? Muted. So uh, we had similar um, benefits to returning, reducing anxiety for fall, trying to get some normalcy socialization for students, decrease some anxiety for fall. Um, some of the risks that we had, um, this was as we talked about last time on Tuesday that it's the community is where things are being spread. So kids are safer in school. However, everyone's also out in the community because they're not in school 24 seven. Um, and that it's a disruption for families as well as we keep, if we are changing the model, um, daycare and things such as that. Um, talking about things that kids could be doing. There are some sports going in community, community services. We heard that things are booked up. And um, a parent said two non-consecutive days does not feel like a routine to middle and high schoolers. We are talking about disrupting the routine. They're saying they don't feel like that is a, really a routine. Um, trying to hit the highlights that no one else hit. Um, and I, there was one. Um, Oh, is it worth changing this routine for only four to five weeks of school? That was the other piece. Great, thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, team four. So if nobody else speaks up, I'll assume that maybe I was breakout room four because <laughs> I apologize <laughs> if anybody else was, I forgot to know what room we were in. Um, does anybody uh, know if Jeff was in group four? <laughs> Roger that, Jeff. You were group okay, four. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I was with him, yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, so risk stress factors of students returning. There was a couple of folks spoke about uh, what that does in terms of potentially singly, singling out remote student, 100% remote students a little bit more. Um, the risk of transmission, increased risk of tracing and quarantining. Um, uh, risk of not returning, a prolonged summer of uncertainty, continued academic loss, and kids are intermingling in other places anyway, and they could be in school where there's more structure, risk of returning full, and then quarantining. Um, we got sort of off topic a little bit on this, but some folks mentioned the risk, this risk is less, a little bit less because of the new standard operating procedure, which limits quarantining. Um, and then there was also a note about the high community transition rate, risk benefit weighing. We were really rushed at the end. The voices that spoke said they thought it was worth it overall to come back um, in, a, in, a, in a safer way as we can manage. There was also a mention of increased testing. If we do return, maybe there's an increased testing as a, an additional layer of protection that doesn't currently exist. Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, group five. Troy, that's you. <laughs> my internet keeps going, my, my internet keeps going in and out. So I don't know if I can do it. Troy, um, so if you, if you I'll, I'll take over. All right, um, I don't have my little list pulled up but I think I have it right here. So it's hard because most of the benefits have already been said. Um, question one, the benefits uh, was really focused on the social needs of students, you know, largely is where that went to. Um, and then what else do I have here? I'm trying to read it on my phone, which is I'm struggling with. Do you have in a bigger version, Bree? Yeah, I can take over. So we had talked about one of the risk or stressors to going four days is those new, bringing those new groups together and thinking about being a responsive classroom school and needing that time to help kids to reconnect. Um, we also know this was talked about a little bit, but are struggling with the idea that the, the four days a week option wouldn't be available to fully remote kids um, and not knowing how many fully remote families would take up that option, but it, it there feels like there's an issue there with not allowing that option for them. Um, I will be honest and say we had most of our group were staff or teachers and we didn't, our parents um, were pretty quiet. So this was definitely a staff heavy group. Um, 
we talked about one of the risk factors uh, stood out to me of not going back four days a week is that we know that especially at the punk club level, but actually for all of our kids, how adults feel and adult discord really um, has an impact on kids. And we know this has been really divisive. So, um, you know, the, 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 the worry about that. And we also know there's a lot of kids really struggling with remote learning and have hit a wall and continuing that into June could be really difficult. Thanks, Bray. Uh, group six. There are, there are only five, so. <laughs> I mean, we could we could talk. Hey, no wonder group with group six was very silent. I was just going to say I'm not sure how many groups there are. So, um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much for um, for having that conversation and for reporting out. Um, we'll move into our discussion of uh, three possible plans for the rest of the year. Um, because it is time to really start talking about um, recommendations or recommendation to the board. So uh, just to review, we've looked at uh, staying with the hybrid model on our current schedule, uh, staying with the hybrid model and adding uh, every other Wednesday morning for alternate cohorts. And that would be four extra one half days per cohort. Um, between now and the end of the year. And then the third option would be a return to school full-time, meaning four days a week, um, starting on May 10th for uh, K through eight. Um, a little bit different at the high school with seniors coming in May 10th through 24th. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Um, and um, the, the nine through 11 uh, we be remaining on their hybrid schedule, and then 9th through 11th returning um, on May 24th for the remainder of the year. Um, and this would give uh, K to eight students anyway, 10 extra days of school between now and the end of the year. So it's time for a discussion. Um, we, if you could raise your hand, if you have uh, a comment to make, we've heard lots of comments, so I don't think we have to, um, you know, restate those things. But those people on the committee, um, what are you thinking now about we've we've looked at risks, we've looked at benefits, we've talked about different ideas, um, thoughts moving forward. Kate Zellers is first. Okay, so um, Pond Cove does not get out of school until 3.05. And a lot of teachers are on dismissal duties and, uh, until 3.15 or even later. Um, and so a lot of them were unable to attend the town hall meeting. Um, so today I did a quick survey of staff to kind of see where they were feeling. Um, and I thought the data was really interesting. Um, I can, if somebody wants to make it so I can share my screen, I am happy to show you guys let's see um is that okay if i show you it's just three questions yeah yeah um okay. i think jen you're uh, there you go <laughs> okay all right so um the first question i asked the staff and this is just pon cove <clears throat> i wrote um and i just said it's an optional anonymous survey so i wrote how important is it that for your mental health and physical well-being that we complete the school year in our current hybrid model, rather than switch to four days a week with Wednesdays still remote sometime after break. So I did it on the sliding scale, one being my mental health and well being would not be affected if we switch to four days a week this school year. And number five would be it would be detrimental to my health and well being if we switch to a four day week this school year. So I sent it to, um, I think, like 60 odd staff members. Um, and this was the first question data which had 35 people or 62% responding at a five, which is that it would be detrimental to my health and well-being uh, to move to a four day week uh, with 21% or 12 responding at a four, three being sort of three people being neutral and then five people saying that it would not be detrimental at all. So just in terms of like, I know the question was based on student safety, but I thought it was really important that, you know, our, our community is not just made up of students, but it's made up of staff as well. 
Um, so that was the first question. Uh, the second question was, how important do you think it is for your students' mental health and physical well-being that we complete this year in our current hybrid model rather than switch to four days a week with one day still remote? Um, so this is just still, this is teachers' opinions on how they think their students' well-being would be affected by a four-day week. So same scale, the one being my students' health and well-being would not be affected or may even benefit from switching to a four-day year four day week this school year. A five being, I think it would be detrimental to my students' health, that should say to my students' health and well-being, sorry, I copied it wrong, to switch to a four day week this year. And the teachers at, and staff are pond at, at Pond Cove. Uh, this was the results, which is that 32 people or 57% of teachers thought it would be detrimental to student health and well-being to return to four day week. 11% thought like a four, with only four, four or seven percent of teachers and staff at Pond Cove thinking that it would be beneficial for students to return to a four-day week this year. And then the last question was, if you had to choose from one of the two options, which one would you prefer? Adding half-day Wednesdays sometime after April break, students remain in cohort of maroon and gold, or switching to a four-day week starting sometime after May 3rd, combining cohorts. And the responses there were, and I didn't do all three options because that was on the previous survey. Um, and the overwhelming response on the previous survey was stay hybrid. So I just said, if, you, if we had to pick going back to school somewhat, which one it would be. And 77% or 41 people said half day, half day Wednesdays, 22% or 12 people saying um, switching to the four day week. So that is where the staff of Pond Cove is. Thanks, Kate. Mm -hmm. Okay, Zakia is next. Thank you, uh, Kate. I, I actually find I find that so interesting. So I'm um, thank you for collecting those data. Um, of course, I'm I I'm a data nerd, so um, I find all data interesting. Um, so I just wanted to briefly sort of say where I am, or just kind of. Um, I, a couple of things, I still have some, um, concerns about a few things, um, just, you know, concerns about the burden on teachers. I have some concerns about, um, sort of, uh, kind of what seems like inequitable, uh, situation or treatment for remote students. Um, particularly, uh, as I said, in the breakout group, there's, they may be a heterogeneous group that had different reasons for staying home originally. Um, and it, it feels a little bit now as though they're, uh, they're being deprived of the same opportunity as the other students. Um, and uh, lastly, can I remember my other concern? It will come to me, but I, um, I, uh, I did want to ask the group how um, they felt about having a different um, approach uh, or a plan going forward for the K through eight um, students versus the middle school and high school students, um, uh, you know, uh, follow, you know, sort of following the, um, the uh, different guidance from the CDC for those two groups, uh, considering right now that we're, the transmission in the community is, is uh, relatively high. So is that K, was that a K, K to four and five to 12? Yes, I'm sorry. The okay. elementary, the middle, and high school. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm no. not. Oh, please forgive me. Sarah Dabo is next. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I just want to say I appreciate the that we the public had an opportunity to add the comments. I think that was really appreciated. Um, and so I just wanted to respond to the survey. Um, so I think you know the first thing that that um, strikes me is the fact that the teacher's assessments of what would be sort of best for physical and mental health of the children um, is, is very different than I think what the parents' impressions are, I think from the parent survey. And then I think a lot of the feedback we've heard in the breakout groups is that parents feel kind of overwhelmingly that, um, that what's best for their children's physical and mental well-being is to get back in school as much as possible. Um, and I think, you know, nobody wants to, to 
hit uh, student mental health against teacher mental health. Um, and I think everyone is, everyone wants their teachers to be in, in sort of at their best, um, in their best place sort of mentally and physically. Um, so I do think that's really important that you pointed that out, that, that there is a, a lot of work to be done to make sure that teachers are supported um, and to kind of piece out exactly what, what would be the taxing aspect to transitioning to, to four or five days a week and make sure that, that we're doing everything we possibly can to support the teachers. Um, but I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think, you know, there are ways that we can, we can address teacher stress and teacher mental health um, beyond kind of just not doing it. Um, because I think that there is there are strong uh, feelings as far as from parents that that the kids' mental health really is uh, best served by being in school. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. So I can only speak for the high school, and I'm now I'm really bummed that I didn't think to do a survey. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, um, I did talk to a bunch of teachers at the high school. Certainly not all of them. And Sonia, if you want to um contradict me please feel free um but the ones i talked to would like to see their kids back um i think doing it having class on wednesday would be kind of a deal breaker because we are still going to have remote kids and we still have to do our lesson plans for both groups so it's not like we're going back to normal school um so i think that's uh I think I think that would be a deal breaker. I think a lot of teachers would be stressed out by having classes in the morning and at least at the high school, it really wouldn't bias much in terms of learning. Um, and I talked to um, some of my kids and asked them about it. Um, and interestingly, I had some remote kids, some I have some all remote kids and then some some hybrid kids and and uh, they all want to come back big time but um the all remote kids didn't seem to you know i worry about them but at least my very small sample size didn't seem too fussed by you know continuing to be remote which was interesting um the one thing i would ask is that whatever we decide if we do go back then we should have really clear um flow chart of this is the, the this is the metric we're using to determine whether we're you know red or orange or or whatever and we ha if we have to change systems that we think about that that we sort of know what it is and, and know what what we're looking at because i know when i looked cdc has one scheme maine has another scheme they don't always make sense together so i think that's important that we're really clear on that I also think that if we go back, that parents really need to understand that it's not going to be normal school, that, you know, right now I've got a little bit of space and so we can do some different things. Kids can move around a little bit. If we're packing in at three feet apart, you know, it really is. You're going to be stuck in your chair for the for the hour. So just be aware. I, and I, not that that's bad. I'm just saying we need to make sure everybody's aware that it's we're not going to go from you know zero to sixty in in one day. We're going to go to like twenty. Um, so anyway, that's what I got. Thanks, Kathy. Sonia. Yeah. So I don't want to contradict anything you've you've said, Kathy. Uh, I've heard uh, similar comments from uh, staff members and even from uh, some students. Um, I just want to, to add that at the high school, we are in a very different situation than from the other two buildings. Uh, because starting as everybody knows yesterday, a lot of our, student of our student population has the option to get vaccinated as well, in addition to the adults. So that puts us uh, in a different situation. This being said, uh, there are some colleagues and Jeff is fully aware of that. Um, who have very large classes, and they are still concerned that they, even with all the students um, having the option to come back, they will not be able to have them all in the same classroom. There will be an overflow. 
So if you have a class of, you know, 23 students and you can only fit 18, five of those students will have to uh, be in the building in a different place. Uh, and if they are in the gym, uh, the gym is not necessarily the best situation where to uh, study. We have had remote teachers who have said that uh, some students have a hard time to listen sometimes to what the teachers is saying, those teachers who are remote, when the students are in the gym. So it, it puts, off, again, an issue of equity potentially for the students who will be in the classroom with the teacher versus those who will be in the overflow, even though they will be obviously not always the same student who will be going to the gym. Um, other concern also are uh, the safety distance where we still have to have in particular for lunch. And uh, are we able to, to do that if the weather is not very cooperative and we can ask them to go out. Um, but again, the high school has more flexibility with the option of open campus. Um, so um, on one side, that's very good. Uh, but on the other side, the those co co colleagues who have very large classes, it's still gonna be a challenge. And I'm not sure yet if we have found uh, a solution to, to accommodate them. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. When? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, briefly talk about some of our other employees that we haven't maybe talked about. We've, we've talked a lot about teachers, but we do have other staff members, um, custodians who, um, who work in our buildings, bus drivers, food service workers. And I just want to make sure that they are also um, fully aware of what, what is going on, that they are also comfortable with what is going on. I know that the you know, custodians I know um, who work lunch would have be exposed to numerous cohorts uh, if they had to be in the in the room with the kids. Um, bus drivers, I want to make sure that they are protected in the way that uh, that, that keeps them safe. Uh, I know a lot of them are you know my age, which is I'll say it's fifty seven. Some are maybe younger, but you know they're an older population. Um, and same thing with our food service workers. So it's important that they um, that they are that they feel safe and um, and. Uh, yeah, that's that's I guess the the, the, the point I want to make. I just think that you know those people have been hard to come by in terms of employing, and I don't think we want to alienate them. So I uh, just want to make sure we're 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 thinking of them as well. Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. Ingrid. So I just like to speak to the um, you know the positives and negatives from my point of view uh, uh, of these, and I think if we are able to do this well. Um, it could be a really good thing for students um, to be getting back into school sooner rather than later. I think yeah, any chance that we have an opportunity that we have to get back to more normal life, I think um, is good for all of us. Um, I think it could help to reduce anxiety in the fall as well. I think if we, if we wait till fall, then we have all these months over the summer where the anxiety of going back has more time to build and it would give everyone a a relatively brief period of time to uh, to be back in school more fully and to reacclimate to that and to some of the situations that we'll probably have in terms of the logistics of this. If we have the distancing in place still for the fall and get to try it out, tweak it and see what we need to change for the fall. Um, that being said, it, it all hinges in my point of view on being able to do it well. Uh, we need to have all those logistics in place. We need the furniture in or that we need in the building in order to accommodate the extra students in classrooms at desks. Uh, and, and that may not be here on time. There's a tremendous amount of schedule changes that would need to be ma made and perhaps additional staff that would need to be hired. And if we don't have all of those things in place, it could really increase anxiety uh, unnecessarily. Um, that is from my own viewpoint, that's the thing that frightens me the most is that we just don't have what we need to do this right. And then it just makes for a miserable experience for everybody. But again, if we had everything in place, I think it could be a real benefit. Um, one thing uh, that concerned me that you mentioned, Donna, in the last meeting is that if Cumberland County was to be put onto the yellow designation, that we would not switch back to hybrid, that we would have to go right to remote. So another concern that I have is that if we say we had a week of everyone back and then Cumberland County got designated yellow, 
and we end up being back in switch to remote for the remaining few weeks of school, we could actually end up with fewer in person days than if we had just stayed with remote. And I think that's a significant factor that needs to be considered because that could happen. And then uh, finally, uh, I have a lot of concern about if we do put Wednesday mornings back in place, if we don't have everybody uh, come back for the four days a week, but instead do Wednesday mornings, it doesn't result in much additional time for students in school. Um, but it really would result in needing to for teachers to need to really cut back on what they're doing for the remote assignments for students. I mean, I speaking from my own experience and for what I see my colleagues putting in as well, it takes a tremendous amount of time to prepare quality remote assignments. And it it's time that takes well beyond the additional hours that we teach would be teaching on a Wednesday morning. So I think the community needs to understand that were that to happen, we would need to uh, change what's happening on remote days to more of something like a menu of things for students to work on rather than these really um, carefully made um, lessons and uh, remote work that they're doing on those days. So I'm not sure that that's a huge gain, but I think if that's if that's what's decided is is the thing to do, um, I I can that's fine. We just need to understand that there's a trade off for that for that one. So. Um, I think that's kind of summarizes where I am in terms of thinking of what are the, the positives. Um, if we can do it well, great. If not, if there, if we don't have what we need in place and uh, then it's just not going to be a positive experience for students or anybody. Thanks Ingrid. Amanda? Thank you. Um, so I, I'm very grateful. I wanna, I really, want to take a second to say how thankful I am that I've been able to and that the public as well has been able to hear all of this information to inform our decisions and um, this is obviously nothing that where any of us are taking lightly. Um, what I keep returning to in my yellow notebook every time we meet, um, I keep writing the same things down. Um, one is our goal that uh, Dr. Wolfram re reminds us of at the beginning of each meeting that we are tasked with, among other, the other two goals, uh, providing learning equity. I'm very concerned that the changes that would uh, that we might put into place if we move to um, four days a week would not provide any increased opportunities for remote students, which is at least, in my understanding, at least um, 100 students in the district. Um, I'm concerned about a plan that leaves them out and puts them at a greater disadvantage is all the disadvantages that parents and teachers have mentioned as being concerns for, um, for hybrid learning. Um, so I have a concern about that. I don't feel comfortable promoting something as being equitable if it leaves out so many students. Um, and just to echo what Ingrid uh, said very well was, um, we are looking at um, how, as much as possible, um, how can we in increase student learning opportunities? And the as possible is really, really important. Um, if we don't have what we need in place, then what we're adding with additional school days might not be the consistency and the rigor and the stamina building. It might not be what we're hoping, um, what parents and teachers are hoping that students are um, experiencing at school. So I think the concerns are very valid, very, very valid. Um, I, I, I am worried about not being prepared to do it, uh, to do it well with the equipment and the staffing and everything and um, poorly organized education it is, is not worth pushing through at this point. Um, yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Sonia? Yes, I have a question. Um, I don't know if it's directly for you, Donna or Jeff. Um, and that's kind of following up on what Ingrid was saying about uh, if Cumberland County was going to uh, yellow. Uh, for the high school, because again, each building has a different situation, because with all the plan proposed for the high school, we're not really changing. One of the plan doesn't change really our schedule. We're just adding more student. Couldn't the high school go to hybrid? instead of fully remote? 
Yeah, um, this is Jeff. Yeah, yeah, and I made that point in our breakout room, but I think the high school is unique to that. I think if that were to happen, we could fairly seamless, I mean, very seamlessly go back to hybrid. Um, I agree with you, Sonia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bree? Hi, I'm gonna try to be short and sweet. I have just a couple of thoughts. Um, I share Amanda's concern about fully remote kiddos. I have a real in my gut problem with having basically a new option, four days a week is a new option and not offering it to all of our kids. I That doesn't feel right to me. So I, I struggle with that. Um, and connected to that, the Wednesdays, I'll speak for me personally, um, Wednesdays are definitely a day that I focus on fully remote students or opportunities that fully remote and hybrid students could do together. I do open Zooms civil rights team, thinking E-team, I believe the middle school civil rights team is on Wednesdays, um, opportunities that would be very difficult to continue, if not impossible with those Wednesdays. So for me personally, I would I would rather go for the four days than, than the Wednesdays, just because that, that I, I struggle with that. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to speak to what, what Ingrid had said about, or a couple of people have said about the, the worry about not being able to do it well. And I, I'll be really honest, I still have some <laughs> lingering trauma from Labor Day weekend when as a Punk Cove staff member, I was at the very last minute getting recess plans and schedules and duties. And it was like the day before kids arrived in the building. And that was a very small group of kids. And we're talking about doubling our amount of kids in our building. And I, I have a concern that we're not going to have all the things we need and we're not going to make sure that our staff is prepared and able to ask questions and able to make sure that um, we're, we're, we're confident and putting on our best face for kids because that's what we do, right? We like put on our best face for kids. So I think those are my two cents. Thanks. I think Zaki was next. Yes, yeah, she was. Thank you. Um, I think also at the beginning of the, um, the meetings, we I, I think you also and then um, talk about bringing the students back to school safely. And so I just want to, you know, not that anybody needs to be reminded, uh, just mention that, you know, there is a reason why we did this in the first place. Nobody wanted any of our students to be removed from the classrooms for, you know, half the week or, you know, three fifths of the week. And, um, you know, ultimately we still are in a pandemic where, you know, um, people are being sickened and dying every day. And that is the ultimate reason why we've had to implement all of these strategies, pull the kids, you know, have the kids out of the school. And, you know, we're ultimately still here talking about what we need to do today. So none of that really has changed. I mean, obviously the landscape changes every day, but, you know, that's what we are still dealing with. And, um, and the, tr you know, truth is, is that we still have high um, case uh, cases, you know, transmission in the community. And it is, you know, uh, it has been increasing. Um, we have variant, more infectious variants um, that are circulating. And um, so, uh, and we don't know what's going to happen this summer. Um, and um, while people are, you know, some of our teachers are getting vaccinated, our students are not yet, um, you know, at least, uh, well, our students in, um, in the high school are not really going to be uh, immunized fully, probably um, this year, um, enough for that to make a difference and nor will they be in the um, elementary or middle school. So I don't think we're really, you know, going to have the benefit of that uh, this school year. And, um, but we are talking about is, um, is uh, to, you know, sort of summarize again, um, bringing more students into the classroom, um, bringing them closer together, and um, uh, removing cohorts, which is, um, you know, having them do more mixing, um, at least in, it sounds like the middle school and probably the high school. Um, and so that, uh, all those things are strategies that we have used in the past to reduce um, transmission in the school, reduce secondary cases. So if an if a infected child comes into the school, um, we've used those techniques to stop, um, you know, the infection from traveling. And so when we're, if we do that, we are going to most likely see more secondary cases in our school. I just need everybody to be aware of that, um, especially in the context of increasing rates in our community. So I just, 
that I just feel like that needs to be said. And the other thing that I'd like to say is that I keep hearing people saying, you know, they're safer in schools than they are in the community. And I know that comes from studies that have shown that um, a lot of trans, you know, most of the transmission is happening in, um, you know, sort of uh, gatherings in the community and not through uh, secondary transmission in the school environment. But it is a false dichotomy to say that they're safer in schools than they are outside because um, that would be to, in, you know, to say that there's no other, you know, choice for a student. And of course, students can be at home um, or they can be playing together masked and at six feet distance or doing a whole host of other things that would not cause uh, coronavirus transmission. So, of course, we have to take personal responsibility and, um, and say that there are lots of ways that students can get together um, or be in the community and not be getting infected. Thank you so much. So thank you, I'm Sarah. sorry to skip the line, but um, I just want to mention that, you know, not a lot of parents have the, the luxury of, of having their children at home and perfectly supervised. So, you know, the, the alternative for working parents is they have to have their child in childcare. Um, and so that's what we're talking about as far as the, the other risks um, is if they're not in school. So I'm going to call on Jill Young. Okay. If you'd like to, just please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Jill? Okay, thank you. I just want to highlight a few health concerns um, that we as school nurses have. We're in the trenches. Um, we deal with this day in and day out. This is, we've been living and breathing, breathing, dealing with and managing COVID-19 in our schools. Uh, one of the concerns that I want to bring up are um, the start dates. Um, I know a few start date options have been thrown out there. But um, travel does, in fact, have an impact. Um, and I believe there was some confusion or maybe some need for education based on some of the comments that I had seen in the past um, about travel. When people travel, just to give you kind of a snapshot, so we follow the main CDC guidelines for travel, which aren't necessarily the best practice, but that's what we follow. And you'll see why that is in a moment. So we require our students to, number one, it's the honor system. So we're really re relying on our community to come through and be honest and forthcoming about their travel and then to do the right thing. And the right thing is to follow the CDC guidelines that we request that everyone follow before returning to school. And those guidelines ask that if you leave the state and go to a state that's a non-exempt state, and that's different if you travel internationally, but if you travel to a non-exempt state and you return prior to your return, 72 hours prior, we ask, and the CDC asks that you provide proof of a negative test. That can be a rapid test or it can be a PCR test, whether you're symptomatic or not. So we have families that do the right thing and they follow that guidance, but here's what it looks like. So they get a negative test before they leave. Let's say they have a Saturday to Saturday trip. They get a negative test on Thursday. Off they go on their trip, they fly, they take taxis and Ubers, they have dinner, they go to theme parks, they're at the resort, they're at their beaches, they're doing excursions, and they unknowingly become infected on Monday. They do their part that's 72 hours prior to their return on Saturday, they get their test on Thursday, their test comes back negative, even though they were unknowingly infected on Monday. That's because a test provides an old snapshot uh, that's about five, uh, captures about five to seven days prior so even though they were unknowingly infected Monday, they have a negative test on Thursday and fly back uh, before they, so negative test Thursday. In the meantime, more excursions, more beach, theme parks, resorts, dinners, Ubers, and a flight home after the negative test on Thursday. And then back in school on Monday with that negative test. While at school on Monday, they become symptomatic come to my office, send home, have a test done and positive. So now those that have entered our school following the protocol have now created a radius of close contacts, if not whole classrooms, depending on the classroom setting. And that impacts others. Um, so we all have to recognize our actions impact others. So we have people that are students that are fearful to come to school because they've made good decisions, but the actions of those sitting around them may quarantine them. So coming back into five, my concern is lack of consistency in education because back to five may very well equal out for 10. Um, and then if we get another case that just keeps adding and adding and adding. So while our quarantine guidelines have changed and meaning, sorry, not quarantine guidelines, our close contact guidelines have changed through the DOE. 
Um, it still has a very significant impact, especially for those individuals that the dart hits. So let me tell you, the darts are flying right now. And I'm hoping that my family doesn't get hit just as everyone's hoping theirs don't too, because it affects your daily life. It's not easy. It's not easy to find childcare because when you're close contact, it's not easy to get a nanny and you can't go to daycare. Um, so there's all those concerns as well. Um, you can't go to work. You can't do the things that you love. Um, so, uh, Community transmission is extremely prevalent, prevalent in Cape Elizabeth. So we, again, I'll tell you again, we send out letters every time we have a case that has directly impacted our school, meaning they were in, in our schools on our campus during their infectious period. But we don't share out letters when we have cases that aren't in our schools um, during their infectious period. And there are many. <laughs> um, and we also have more and more students being quarantined and staff being quarantined from exposures outside of school. Every day, more and more students and staff are exposed at home or throughout the community, and it's impacting them. Now they're home for 10 days. Um, so it's very prevalent. And the way that it was um, something new that uh, I wanted to just share that came to be <laughs> recently in the last few days is we have staff that have kids and kids that go to different schools and kids that go to different daycares and their kids are becoming close contacts because I'm about to talk about this new variant that we're dealing with, but it's very prevalent in kids. Um, and so now their kids are close contacts and while they're vaccinated, somebody's got to take care of their kid. So now they're out of school. So we have to keep that in mind too, that this, even though our staff is vaccinated, this, could, this virus still very much so impacts their ability to come in and do their job. Um, so start dates, I would really stress the importance of waiting um, uh, as long as we can, at least 10 days before returning to school. Um, cases, as I said, are spiking the Portland Press Herald. It was on the front page of the 401 cases that they reported yesterday. 50% of those were under the age of 30. Um, and that's not surprising. This new variant, the B117 variant is prevalent in children. And it's thought to be 50% more transmissible than the wild variant that was the initial variant that did not seem to impact kids as much. So there is concern by the public health experts now that this variant, since it's more transmissible, those health experts um, out of the University of um, Minnesota, public health expert, I'll just pull it up so I don't misquote, um, from the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy back on March 25th, he was a full um, doctor, uh, I'm sorry, Michael Osterholm, is um, PhD, master's in public health, and the director in, um, of, trying to find his title here, I'm so sorry, I had it all pulled up and it died in my long speech here. But um, anyway, he had supported coming back in to schools, bringing the K through eight back in, and now he's pulling back the reins and saying that he feels we may be misguided. Um, the three foot, you can pull up the article, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy Experts, three foot rule in schools, problematic in light of COVID variants. Um, several experts are concerned that schools may be opening during an, an inflection point in the pandemic and are being misguided on how to do so. Um, and I'm almost done here, but he says, so Michael T. Osterholm, PhD, MPH, Director of University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy and the publisher of this journal, is worried that it's going to lead to a different level of transmission. We're already seeing substantial transmission, he said. He who had originally supported opening of K through eight schools given the dynamics of the wild type virus. But Osterholm said that the CDC recommendations were based just on that, on data done when only a, the original wild type virus was circulating, not B117. What little science supports three versus six feet goes out the window here. Is six feet even safe, he says. And the article ends and I'll end with the chance of things calming down right now are so close with vaccines and the variant can't take off unless we give it the opportunity. That article and there's um, an, a couple other art new articles that are in our, uh, on our, uh, posted on our website for people to read. Um, oh, I do have one other thing, sorry. I'm so sorry, my flip, my post it over. Um, but I see this as coming back as taking a band-aid off and I, um, Mr. Eastman and I have a joke about Band-Aids and that my job is to put on Band-Aids. <laughs> so um, this is a perfect reference, but 
um, we're going to take the Band-Aid off. And when we need, when we're going to do that, it's nice if we can take it off kind of slowly and painlessly and not take that scab off. But I'm concerned that as we're taking these mitigation measures away, we're taking away social distancing from six feet to three feet or reducing, not taking it away, I'm sorry, reducing it. And we're taking away our cohorting that's taking away mitigation measures where at the same time, so many avenues of exposure are being opened and put those two things together and it's the perfect storm. So our Band-Aid no longer comes off gently. Our Band-Aid comes off, we pull the scab off and we have a big mess on our hands is what I'm concerned about. Thanks, Jill. Ingrid, your hand is still up. Do you have something else you want to I just wanted to ask a clarifying question of you, Donna, because I was a little confused after something Jeff <clears throat> Shed had said. So. I believe if I heard you correctly in our last meeting, you said that if Cumberland County was moved on to yellow, that were we, if we had moved to more like the four day week in person, that we would automatically go to right to remote, not to hybrid. So that Could would really clarify be, that please. Yeah, that would really be the K to eight because of the, the severe change in schedules that we're looking at for the coming back for the four days. The high school is a different story. Uh, as we know, we look at all the schools, um, you know, differently as far as their schedules go. So it wouldn't impact them as much. So yeah, that okay. is. So, so for K to eight, it would automatically go, we would go to remote yeah. where we come and put on yellow. Okay, thank you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, it's 422. Um, we're still going back and forth about um, the three options um, and within the third option, um, possibly doing things a little bit differently for uh, depending on the age group. Um, would anybody like to speak to removing one of the options or is the feeling of the group that we take the three options to the school board um, and have some discussions with them. They they have been listening to um, to these recordings, and some of them are um, in this group. Um, and um, there's been lots of information shared. It's all good information. Different people have different opinions. I'm not sure that we're going to convince one group of um, to go with the opinion of the other group. And um, we're really a recommending committee. Uh, so is the feeling of this committee that we take the options to the school board or um, anybody want to talk about that? Kathy? Oh, sorry. Kate was next. Had her, yeah, Kate had hers up first. I guess that was just my question was, and maybe I need to go look at the materials again, is um, what, I know we were going to make, I guess, a recommendation to the board, I guess, is what are our options in terms of what we say to the board? You know, do we have to take a vote and send one? Can we send these three? Can we vote on these three and see where they like, what ways do we have to make a recommendation? What are our options in terms of making a recommendation to the board? Our, rec our options would be take one, our recommendation would be um, take one, two or three of these options to the board if we can't make a decision within our within our group. We have we have a lot of people in this group. So it's really difficult when you have so many people of so many dif differing opinions um, to come to consensus. Sometimes it's possible, but most of the time um, it isn't. So Kathy, thoughts? Um, I would take the half day on Wednesday option off the table, at least speaking for the, the high school. I think um, it, however you work however you work it teachers need wednesday to get their act together to plan to do two sets of lesson plans if we don't have that it's all going out to win the window i i just think that's not a tenable situation for for teachers um i just don't think it's doable so i'd like to take that one off the table that's what i was going to say too i i also vote we take half day wednesdays off the table is there anybody that has a strong feeling against that? I mean, I, I do only because if you look at the data that I presented today, when teachers at Pond Cove were presented, like if they had to choose one option or the other, like staying hybrid was not an option. We had to add more time. The overwhelming choice was for Pond Cove was adding Wednesdays. You know, I, I can go back and look at it again, but it was, um, it was, 
it was an over, it was a large amount of, of Pond Cove teachers who would rather add a half day Wednesday than go back four days. Well, and that was not just teachers, that was staff as well. Uh, I think it's, uh, we, we make the job diff more difficult for the school board if we give them three options. I think that's a lot for them to debate and, and figure out. I'm not sure if there is, uh, is there room, if there is room for different models for the different schools um, based on what Kate has just said. Um, but uh, my, my feeling is that um, having, you know, a lot of options for the school board seems to be, um, you know, it's not, I, I just think that the panel needs to, to come up with, with uh, a good plan that we, we send forward. Other thoughts? Sonia? I agree with what Wynn said for the reason that in this panel, you have staff from the three different buildings who know the day-to-day -day reality. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can simplify that for the school board, it would avoid them to have questioned back to us if that were the case. So because in this committee, we have people who are in the classroom or in those three different buildings, I think we can attest to that and recommend, you know, in each building, it's not going to be the same plan, what they think would work the best. Thank you. Other thoughts? Laura? Oh, you're muted, Laura. I do it every time. Um, just thinking about, uh, I think it was Wynn who said, or someone said different models for different schools. And then I'm reading the comments from the bus driver, um, just pointing out how they're short anyway. And I, I don't know exactly how all the bus schedules work. I'm pretty happy that I don't, but I, I would think that would be problematic for transportation if we're talking about different models for different schools. Um, so I, and I would also be in favor of taking that Wednesday off. Ingrid? Um, I'm also going to come out and say something different than what my Ponco colleague said and say that I, I think Wednesday should come off the table. I think had we out, had a question been asked of, um, you know, is the is the benefit to be gained by students uh, from being in school? Um, the very say so either both cohorts would get maybe six hours. I think it is two half days before the end of the year. Um, okay. Is the is the trade off for students for the time in school that little bit more time in school worth it for the cost and what it would result for in the quality of their remote instruction uh, and what the teachers can provide on on Wednesdays for them for individual support like we're doing now. Um, I'm not sure he would have gotten a result of saying, yes, let's go for Wednesdays. I think people would have said, absolutely not. It's not worth that. If the question had not been, do you want this or would you prefer this or this? Not right. jumping in, but I just want to echo what Ingrid said. Like in my, in my mind, that's the question. Like, is it, is it worth it? Um, when I look at what's good for kids and all kids and, and, that that option is a resounding no for me. The other two I struggle with and could do pros and cons, but that one's I think is really clear about the Wednesdays. So what we could do is represent the con concerns with Wednesdays to the board and let them know that um, while it was a choice over one thing over another upon Cove, um, it might not be the preference for the final decision. Um, if you if you ask people what their preference was, so I'm comfortable with representing that point. It it represents uh, the the point that um, the Pond Cove teachers are making, but um, but also um, the point about the trade off for a small amount of time and a valuable. Um, valuable planning time for teachers, valuable use of time for teachers. So that leaves us with two options. Um, are people comfortable with two options? And within the one option, certainly there would be um, 
room for different plans at different schools. Donna, we have Kate and Wynn both, and Kate is oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Kate? I just wanted to go back to the original survey that we talked about, uh, the staff survey that was sent out before this committee began. Um, and of the staff, here I can show it again. Um, so this was the result of the staff survey, which was in an effort to increase school time this year, would you prefer maintain the school the same schedule, restructuring class, uh, students return Wednesday or Wednesday morning. Um, this, there were 75 responses of maintaining the current schedule. So when I did my data for Pond Cove, the reason I did, if you had to pick one or the other, was that we had this data showing that overall the staff, it was really clear what the staff preferred. Right. Um, and so when I presented Wednesdays as an option for Pond Cove, it was, well, if we had to have one, um, I, th I think this data makes it clear that if there were three, that this one would be that one, or at least it did when this, when this survey was done. Right, so that takes us down to the two options for sure. Just very quickly uh, with Laura, Laura had talked about the bus drivers and I had talked earlier about the bus drivers. And I just wanna make sure that the panelists see that we do have a bus driver in attendance who has made some um, good comments about uh, where they stand on this and, and how they feel. So please, please make sure we see those. Thank you. All right, so we have, we're down to two options. I don't think we're in a position to make a decision about one over the other at this point, um, unless anybody uh, feels that we're able to do that. It doesn't, uh, listening to the comments, it does not sound like we're, uh, we're at that point. So um, I think, would people be comfortable if we took both of the options to the school board um, and had more discussion that night? I think we could discuss if we met again, we have a meeting scheduled for, thir uh, for the 13th in the afternoon, but I think we could probably talk for, for three hours and still come to where we are now, Kathy's shaking her head, yes. Um, so I think it makes sense um, to move this to the school board at this time. Amanda? Thank you. Um, I personally am in favor of, of um, putting forth both options. I think there are risks and benefits in both that are worthy of consideration. Um, I would like, if possible, to make a note of um, continuing to look for options to increase in-person and uh, time for remote students or time for the remote students to um, interact with their peers in person, however much possible. Um, perhaps that's work for, you know, af after a decision's made, but I just don't want that concern to go away. Thank you. And Zakia. Um, do you, uh, would there be an opportunity to discuss then the um, differing, the plan for um, the, the different age groups, the elementary versus middle school and high school at the board meeting, or should that be done at a prior meeting? Uh, that, that would, that might come up. Um, it really would be, um, I think up to um, certainly the, the administrators to, to make a decision about whether it's do whether that would be doable or not. So, um, okay, I'm just wondering whether it's important to go in there with a clear plan about how the that would differ, um, how the plan would differ. Certainly, we could present some options. I think we we've, we've talked about it enough that we mm -hmm. okay we would have some options to present on that. Thank Donna, you. Would it would it be possible just to make a very quick um, clarification of what those two models are? I think there's some people who are still confused about them. Sure. I think the one option would be the staying with a hybrid model on our current schedule. Um, and then the third, it would be the third option, uh, returning to school four days a week. Um, and that might look different at different schools. 
Thank you. So Donna. Sorry. I don't know how to raise my hand the way everybody else does apparently. Um, so I just raised my hand. Um, I think that we are, I agree that we're gonna kind of hit a bit of a stalemate, but I think, I think the purpose of this committee to me is much more about information gathering um, and just giving the board more information to work with. Um, we now have some staff surveys, we have parent surveys, we have um, a lot of feedback and input. So I feel comfortable, I, I think that is a good use of this committee is to kind of bring out those thoughts and, and really give the board some, I think some information to, to make their best decision on uh, because they really represent the community and the schools. And I think that they will do that thoughtfully. Um, but I do value the staff um, surveys. I value the parents, parent surveys. I just, I think, I think we're never going to get to a place. I agree with you where everybody, because we all have different roles in this. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end of the day, we all care about kids and we want to do what's best for them. And, and I think the board does that as well. So um, I think we're, this group has served a good purpose and, and I think it kind of can only, I don't want to muddy the waters more. I think that it's much more about letting them take that information and making their best decision. It's okay. Great, thanks, Troy. Um, Bree, and then I need to let you go. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just struggling because I feel like this puts the board in a tough position because we're kind of bringing them like, <laughs> here's well, the two options that, you know, we're- It's a tough position, Bree, and- yeah. yeah. I guess, so I'm just gonna say something that maybe just maybe just muddies the water and I should keep it to myself. But in an, uh, in an ideal world, there would be like an option where our kids that are struggling the most, cause I'm just thinking about the kiddos that have really hit walls and that being in the building more could be really, really helpful. And I'm also thinking about my colleagues that asking them to make this, this, this again, make this huge shift is, is, is I really worry about the mental health of some of my colleagues is, is there a way that buildings could look at our ability to pull kids that are struggling in more? Um, and we need to have a criteria for what struggling looks like. And, and maybe maybe we're too far down the road for that, but I know other schools have done those sorts of things um, where they've hired ed techs to do like a study hall. I think the middle school is doing something like that. Like is, is there, I, I'm, I'm, I, I know how much discords in our community. I feel like either direction the school board goes of those two options is gonna make a, a big group of important stakeholders really unhappy. Um, and so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just struggling and I'm feeling a little badly that we're not giving more direction to the board. Um, thanks, Bree. Um, we have been all along bringing kids, bringing more kids back, the struggling students. So that, that is going on and that will continue to go on. People are, um, administrators, teachers are really looking at students, and if we can, if we can bring people back for more time, we have been doing that all along. So that that has been going on. So Heather, <laughs> thanks, Donna. Um, so I just wanted to say to everybody that um, I've been listening. Um, I wasn't at the meeting two days ago, but I because um, I I couldn't be there, but I did uh, watch it. Um, board members are maybe not present, but I've been telling them that they need to tap in to all these meetings and watch and listen to the recordings. Um, as Wynn said, there is an amazing amount of information here. Um, and so I just want to let the community know, let people in this community know, uh, this committee know um, that, yeah, it's, it, the, this decision um, it is going to not be easy. And as Bree mentioned, um, you know, we're not going to probably please all constituents, um, all parents and people in the community. Um, but, but the committee here has done their work to bring forward um, a lot of information for us to discuss as a group. Um, and so my guess is Tuesday night, um, all the board members, they're very conscientious, will show up having done uh, their work of watching and um, taking in all of this information from all of these meetings. Um, and we will, we will, we will do the best we can to make the best decision possible um, for students um, thinking about what's going on. But um, I just want to thank everybody for their time and their commitment um, and just try to um, remind everybody that we're all trying to do our best. Um, so Thank you, Donna, for leading these meetings. I thought they um, 
each time posed a different point of view, a different aspect uh, that was important for us to look at. Um, so I just wanted to speak up and say thanks to everyone and we'll tune in on Tuesday. Thank you, Heather. Um, we knew going into this that um, there was a good possibility that this committee would not come up with one recommendation. And that's why I've been careful to say each time recommendations um, because it, it is a difficult situation and, and things are always changing and that makes it even more difficult. Daily things can be changing. Um, so um, we will move forward and um, do the best we can. And, and the board has a, a very difficult decision. Boards across the country have had these difficult decisions to make. And um, when they make their decision, we will move forward with whatever it is and, and do the best we can. Um, always thinking about what's best for our students. So I wanna thank everyone um, for your participation. You, made some great comments, brought forth some really important information, points of view, and um, it, there's a lot to think about. So thank you very much. Um, have a great rest of your evening, and I'm sure you'll be tuning in on Tuesday night uh, for the meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.